number 11 today. And uh, glad everybody could be here. Glad for those of you that are tuning in through the live stream. Have something for you this morning that I believe the Lord gave me in my Bible reading uh, not too long ago. Something I've never seen before. I thought it was really interesting. So I'm going to give that to you today. Now, uh, basically, this is going to pertain to prophecy and some things that will probably be taking place, I would imagine, within the next 15 years or so. And as a disclaimer, I'm going to present some things this morning that uh, you might be familiar with, some things you'll be familiar with, but I'm also going to present a few ideas that are uh, new, you know, and by new, I mean they deviate from some of the commonly accepted theories. They're, don't worry, they're not heresy, or it's not the church is going through the tribulation, or, you know, any, any crazy stuff like that. These are just little deviations on our understanding of prophecy, and some of the, uh, the order of things, and some of the things will take place, and... Uh, um, basically, when it comes to prophecy, we should look at things. The Bible says, despise not prophesying, but prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And so there's a number of things that uh, Bible teachers have taught over the years that we really just need to always be willing to scrutinize, go back to the drawing board. And if something doesn't fit, we need to acknowledge that it just doesn't fit and try to find the right answer rather than just keep trying to jam the square hole into the round or the square peg into the round hole, you know what I mean? Um, reading through the Bible, uh, especially the Old Testament prophets, and understanding prophecy is, the way I, I look at it is kind of like trying to do a Rubik's Cube. If any of you have done Rubik's Cubes, I hate Rubik's Cubes. I've never been able to do them in my life. I, oh, they drive me crazy. But some people love them. And you see people on the, on the show, some people can even do it with their feet and uh, do it in just a matter of seconds on YouTube. I don't know how they do that. But uh, with a Rubik's Cube, when you're doing that thing and spinning that thing all around, sometimes you'll get one side and it'll have all the colors. And you'll think, man, I've finally done it. But then you start looking at the other sides and the other sides are still all mixed up. And so what that means is, yeah, you've got part of it, but you're missing other parts of it and you're not done yet. And so you can't declare the prophecy puzzle to be solved if it only looks good uh, from one angle. Because when it comes to Bible prophecy, yeah, you might have a theory that looks good from this direction, but with Bible prophecy, you should be able to look at it from multiple angles and it should always keep lining up. And that's one of the ways you can kind of verify if you have the right understanding of prophecy. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 19.15, At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall a matter be established. And so, technically, that verse in Deuteronomy is referring to matters of crime and punishment. Okay, But this general principle of verification with multiple witnesses is consistent throughout the Bible, and the same is true of prophecy. You want to be able to look at it from different angles and be able to uh, have the things still come out right. Uh, Jesus, for example, said himself, he said, If I bear witness of myself, like I'm the only one, my witness is not true. He said that over there in the book of John. He went on to state that he had multiple witnesses to validate himself. He had John the Baptist, you remember. He had the miracles that he performed. He had the Father. He had the Scriptures. He had the Holy Spirit, the water, and the blood we have in 1 John 5. In other words, you could scrutinize Jesus from seven different angles, and every side would be consistent as to who he was and who he claimed to be. Uh, and, or in the allegory of a Rubik's Cube, every side would be the solid color, right? It means you got it right. When it comes to the Bible and prophecy, we're not supposed to take one verse and declare what it means and then uh, have no other verses to back up our theory. Okay, And that when you do that, when you just take one verse and you declare, okay, this is what this means, and this is a prophetic interpretation, but you don't have any other scriptures to back it up from any other angle, that's called a private interpretation. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. And the way we verify which Bible teachings are true and which Bible teachings are not true is by comparing Scripture with Scripture, right? Uh, God has set His book up in such a way that if the Apostle John wrote something, it'll be backed up by, you know, Daniel and Isaiah. Or if, uh, you know, Moses predicted something, it'll be backed up by something Paul said or Habakkuk said. The book, uh, Comparing Scripture with Scripture, you are able to verify what's right and what's not right. And so when it comes to the prophecy puzzles in the Bible, uh, we always need to keep our brains in check. Uh, if this book contradicts our theory on something, then the book is right and our theory is wrong. Even It doesn't matter how long we've held to the theory. 
It doesn't matter who came up with the theory or who taught you the theory. And it doesn't matter how many good godly Christians and how many denominations teach that theory. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, it's wrong. And we have to be able to put, keep this book exalted above us. And not our, us or our denomination or our school or our favorite teacher above the Bible. Okay? Um, some people call that, you know, disrespectful. You know, it's disrespectful. And I always got to kick this because this is a real prevalent thing among, among Christians sometimes. It's disrespectful to disagree with great Bible teachers. Well, let me just say, I think it's disrespectful to hold... Uh, to God to hold those men in a position of infallibility. I think that's disrespectful to God. I think it's disrespectful to the Bible to cling to a man's theory even though the there are flaws in that theory that are obvious and clearly contradict Scripture. I think that's disrespectful to the Bible. And so if I had to choose one or the other, you know, I'm going to choose to be respectful to God and the Bible, <laughs> even if somebody says that I'm being disrespectful to a man. In reality, disagreement is not disrespect, but there's a lot of people who, for some reason, think that. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, this prophecy here is a prophetic chapter. This, well, this chapter here, Isaiah 11, is a prophetic chapter in the Bible. And it has a lot to say about the millennial reign of Christ and some things about the tribulation period. For example, we won't read the whole chapter, but in chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, it talks about King, King Jesus. When Jesus Christ rules and reigns on the earth, it describes some things about his kingdom and the way he's going to rule in righteousness. And then in verses 6 through 9, it talks about the kingdom of Jesus. It's the classic passage where it's talking about the wolf dwelling with the lamb. You know, the lion is going to eat straw like the ox, and no one is going to hurt or destroy one another in Jesus' kingdom. This is all prophetic of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. But look at verse 10. It says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. All right, that's speaking of Jesus Christ. He is the ensign, essentially. He's the light on the hill. He's the one that the Gentiles will seek to, and his rest, Jesus' rest, is going to be glorious. And then in verse 11 it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the third time to recover the remnant of his people. No, that's not what it said. It said, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. Now, this is just a short, short little detour, but it's very interesting here. Uh, Isaiah says that God is going to recover his people the second time. Now, he gathered the remnant of the Jews once in 536 B.C. We remember that in the Bible. We re read about that in the book of Ezra. Um, God is going to recover his remnant a second time. And the context here is when Jesus takes the throne, right? We got two recoveries and, two, and basically two scatterings. Now, it's interesting that it doesn't say that God is going to recover his remnant three times. And... What's important about that is the declaration of Israel as a nation and the Jews migrating to the land of Israel from Germany and from the United States and all the countries of the world and other parts of the world. That gathering in 1947 is not one of the gatherings prophesied in Scripture. Uh, it's normally taught that way. And uh, granted, the 1947 declaration of the land of Israel was a miracle. And that was a significant time in history, but it's not one of the regatherings technically in the Bible. The first regathering was in 536 under Cyrus. The second regathering is going to be under Jesus Christ in the millennium, when the millennium begins. Um, and what's interesting about that is when Isaiah wrote this, when he said that God is going to recover his people the second time, they hadn't even been scattered the first time. Can you imagine Isaiah's audience saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> the second time, we have, what, what? That, that was, the, the dispersion of Israel was still 100 years in the future when he wrote that, and the, the first regathering was still 200 years off when he wrote that. That's quite a prophecy. So he was prophesying that, hey, Israel's going to be scattered and then recovered, happened in 536, and then he said they're going to be scattered again, 
and they're going to be recovered again. Right now, technically, the Jews are still in that position, that category of being scattered right now. To this day, they're still under the category of scattered, even though they have a country and even though they've got a little foothold. Um, and it was just recently that the population in Israel finally surpassed the Jewish population in New York City. That just happened last year. So the Jews are still considered scattered, and, God is, and they're going to get scattered again under the Antichrist here shortly. Uh, and then God's going to recover them at the end of the tribulation, at the start of the millennium. So that's just kind of an important sideline that you might want to pay attention to when it comes to considering uh, prophecy and this whole thing about 1947. Um, so verse uh, 12 through 14 talks about the execution of Jesus' enemies at the Battle of Armageddon. And then in verse 15 it says, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Now you remember when Israel came out of the land of Egypt, God parted the water and they went through on dry ground. And God's saying at the end of the tribulation, there's going to be a similar thing happen where the tongue of the Egyptian sea is going to be smacked and uh, they're going to go over on dry land essentially and go back to the nation, the land of Israel. And uh, so these verses are talking about the return of the remnant. And like I said, during the tribulation period, the Jews are going to be scattered. The, the Great Tribulation period is going to be basically the Holocaust 2.0. Uh, the Antichrist is going to make Hitler look like Mother Teresa. And it's not going to be good. Uh, the world can create their League of Nations, which they did after World War I, which failed miserably. And then the world can create their United Nations, which they created after World War II, which is failing miserably. <laughs> uh, but they're not going to change what God has written. These things are going to take place, and these, this prophecy here in Isaiah was written back in 700 B.C., and it has not come to pass yet. Therefore, as Bible believers, this is still going to happen. This is going to happen. Uh, the world will again turn on the Jew, and the Jews are going to be scattered. And when Jesus takes the throne, the Jews from around the world are going to be brought to Jerusalem. And they're going to be basically the offering of the Gentiles saying, hey, here's your people. We're bringing them to you. We're bringing them on our shoulders. We're transporting them. We're, we're giving them all this reality. We're bringing them to Jerusalem. And that's uh, what the Gentile nations are going to be doing at the beginning of the millennium. Now, what I want to focus on here this morning is this prophecy regarding Egypt's river. In verse 15, like I said, it says, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. Now, this prophecy, like I said, has never been fulfilled. If you look this up online, people are saying, Oh, this is being fulfilled before our very eyes. The Nile River has, uh, is uh, drying up. You know, and it shows these pictures of a famine in Egypt and, you know, the river is kind of drying up, you know. That, yeah, exactly. Small drought. Exactly. That's, it, it, that's not the fulfillment of the prophecy. The thing we're talking about here is the smiting of the river and the thing being dry like it was the Red Sea type thing. Now, if you had to guess, what river in Egypt is this probably talking about? Nile. The Nile River, of course. The mo one of the most famous rivers in the world. Uh, the Nile River is arguably the, actually the longest river in the world, interestingly enough. It's a giant river. Uh, the, there is arguing, you know, back and forth between the Brazilian government and the Egyptian government as to whether the Nile is longer or the Amazon is longer. They kind of argue about it. But it's generally accepted that the Nile River is longer. I don't know why they argue. They say that the Nile River is 4,132 miles long. Long. That's a long river. Uh, the Amazon is 3,977 miles long. Okay, And to put the length of the Nile into perspective, take a guess how many miles it would be to drive from the coast at Seaside, Oregon to Miami, Florida. Who wants to take a guess as to how many miles that is? 3,000. Anybody else? 3,000? I looked it up on uh, Google Maps. The, from, from Seaside, Oregon to Miami, Florida would be, and it's a pretty straight line, it's not super squiggly, it's 3,337 miles. That's still 800 miles short of how long the Nile River is. Just think of how long that river is. That is incredible. 
Yeah, I know, seriously. And, and so that is a long stinking river, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, even in a, granted the, the river meanders around and you're gonna have, you know, some of its length because of it meandering. But even at that, from north to south, as the crow flies in a straight line, the Nile River is still 2,400 miles long. That is a big river. And the Amazon is only 1,100 miles of straight line distance. So the Nile River is undoubtedly the victor, the winner, the greatest river in the world. All right, so the Nile River is a great river. And who made it that way? God made it that way. God made it. All right, the Nile River has a few sources that contribute to its size, but for all practical purposes, it begins near the equator at Lake Victoria in Tanzania, and then it flows northward and empties out at the Mediterranean Sea. And the Nile River flows from Lake Victoria all the way to about right here, to about Cairo, Egypt, okay? And then it starts to split off and go out and it, and it forms the Nile River Delta. Now, the Lord said that he was gonna smite that river in its seven streams. But the only problem is the Nile River only has two streams right now. And I thought that was weird. At Cairo, the Nile River divides into two different streams. It divides over to the west to the Rosetta. They call this stream the Rosetta or the Rosetta Tributary. Uh, to the east, it divides off into the Damietta. And so there's only two streams there. And so it makes you wonder, you know, what river is God talking about here? Are we looking at the right river? There really aren't any other seven streamed rivers in Egypt. So when I read this not too long ago, I was thinking, what in the world is this talking about? What river in the world is like this? What, what is this? And I've always wondered about the verse, so I started doing some research, and guess what I found? For nearly as long as the Nile River has been in existence, it has had seven tributaries, seven streams. Due to canal building, flood control, silting, and various other things, there are now only two streams left. But the fact that the Nile had seven streams for thousands of years tells us that we've identified the correct river that God is talking about. Um, back when Isaiah wrote the prophecy, he mentioned the river he was referring to had seven streams and everybody would identify it instantly with Egypt, the Nile River. Okay, So in the future, God is going to smite the Nile River and cause men to go over dry shod. Now this is a uh, prophecy that actually shows up a couple times in the Bible. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit of help here. Uh, Mark, would you read Isaiah 19, 4 through 5? And uh, let's see, Doug, would you be willing to read a verse there, Ezekiel 29, 8? All right, Mark has an Isaiah 19, 4 through 5, and then after him, uh, Ezekiel 29, 8. And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a I find that really interesting that he says, I will give the Egyptians over into the hand of a cruel lord and a king of fierce countenance. Who does that sound like? <laughs> yeah, it sure does. <laughs> but he says, the Egyptians I will give over to them. So that's something to think about. All right, go ahead and read uh, Ezekiel 29. Uh, 8 through 11. Okay. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon you, and cut off man and beast out of thee. And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste, and they shall know that I am the Lord, because he hath said, The river is mine, and I have made it. Behold, therefore, I am against thee, and against thy rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate. From the tower of Syene, even unto the border of Ethiopia. No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited forty years. And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate forty years. And I shall scatter the Egyptians among the nations, and will disperse them through the countries. All right, so you have there a prophecy of Egypt again. It's amazing you read through Isaiah and Ezekiel especially, and you start reading all these prophecies about Egypt. Egypt showing up. There's all these things that God said was going to happen to Egypt, and none of them have happened yet. 
which means they still have to be future prophecies, right? They have to happen sometime. I mean, we can't go through the tribulation, or well, we're not going to go through the tribulation, but you can't have the tribulation happen and the millennium and all this stuff and these prophecies not be fulfilled. I mean, God's Word, it's not like we're going to get to the end of the thing and the Lord's going to be like, oh man, I, I forgot about those prophecies about Egypt. We've we got to do something about that. No, that's not going to happen. Um, so it says that uh, you got these verses here about God smiting uh, Egypt and it being desolate for 40 years. No foot of man will pass through it. No foot of beast will pass through it. That's never happened. And so that's still got to be a prophecy that's going to happen. And uh, let's see. So I'm going to just do this and do this. All right, that took a minute, but we got it. All right. Now, the question is, why does God have such, such a beef with Egypt? <laughs> what? There's so many prophecies in the Bible about Egypt. He already blew it up once, you know, in Moses' day, and yet all these prophecies are still future. Why is God going to utterly destroy Egypt again? Well, the answer is because Egypt is going to be the home of Mystery Babylon here in the next few years. I really believe that. I know that's not a pop, that's not a theory. I know of anybody. I don't think anybody else believes that. I've never heard that taught. I'm not taking this from somebody. But based on my own Bible studies, and like I said, the Rubik's Cube thing when it comes to Mystery Babylon and Rome, there's just a few things that don't fit. And so I've gone back to the drawing board, and it looks like to me the Antichrist is going to be out of the Egyptian kingdom, and Mystery Babylon is going to be in, down in Egypt. Uh, you remember that lesson that I did on Satan's seven heads, right? Um, and how I told you that Rome was the sixth head, or the sixth kingdom. Five kingdoms are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. Rome would be that sixth kingdom, and there is one more kingdom to come, and that seventh head, I believe, is going to be Egypt. Okay, Rome has to fall. And again, this isn't something that people generally teach. So I'm not saying that you have to believe this. I'm just presenting some information. And, uh, you know, just kind of file it away. You don't have to believe me right away, but just kind of hear me out and think about it a little bit. Rome has to fall. Most Bible teachers make the Antichrist, the Pope, and Mystery Babylon, the Vatican. I don't think that is the case. They're connected, and it's not to let Rome off the hook. Okay, Rome and the Vatican is still run by the same uh, evil spirit that is going to be taking over Mystery Babylon. Okay, but Rome is the iron legs, and the legs have to go in order to make way for the feet. The feet is the next kingdom, and uh, Rome is the sixth head, and it has to go in order to make room for the seventh head to come in, the seventh king, the seventh kingdom. Now, uh, all I say, you know, when it comes to this stuff, I'm going to present a little bit of this today. All I ask is that you consider it, you know, pray about it, think about it from time to time when you read your Bible, and uh, I believe if you'll do that, some of these mysterious verses in the Bible that really don't have a place, that nobody's been able to figure out where they go, like a puzzle, uh, they're going to start making a little bit more sense if you kind of have that idea in the back of your mind. Uh, like I said, the mystery Babylon equals Rome and Vatican City theory has a lot of good things to it, but like the Rubik's Cube, only one, two, maybe three sides have solid colors and looks really good. But there's still a few things about that theory that just they don't make sense. And that's why a lot of people have abandoned the Rome, the Vatican theory and they've thought well maybe it's going to be Mecca. You know, some people say well maybe it's New York City. Why are they guessing these things? Because they've acknowledged and they've recognized that the Rome theory doesn't fit completely. You know, I'm, I'm not letting Rome off the hook. Uh, Rome and that spirit that runs Rome right now, uh, Mystery Babylon, uh, you know, Mystery Babylon, well, let me think here. Mystery Babylon, basically right now in Rome, is that, that spirit is there, but that spirit has been there for the last seven kingdoms that the devil has run. That Mystery Babylon spirit basically started way back in the day of Cain. You know, and uh, has run throughout that whole time. And so that spirit has moved, and I think it's going to move one more time from Vatican City down to Egypt. Egypt and Israel are essentially the epicenter of the end times. You could throw Assyria in there too. And as I mentioned in the last lesson, Egypt is the antithesis of Israel. It always has been, right? Egypt has always been the arch enemy of Israel. And so in the tribulation, it looks like it's going to be basically Egypt versus Israel, the Antichrist versus the Jews. Israel is God's land. 
by all indications, it looks like Egypt is Satan's land. And so it's very interesting to me that God designed the Nile River, right? And he made it to have seven streams. You might even say it's a seven-headed river, right? <laughs> very interesting. Just a coincidence. All right, yeah. Well, look at Ezekiel 32. Ezekiel 32. Let's flip around and look at some Bible verses now. We'll get back to some of these things in just a second. But Ezekiel chapter 32 and verse 2. Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations, and thou art as a whale in the seas. And thou camest forth with thy rivers, and troublest the waters with thy feet, and foulest their rivers. All right? Now, this prophecy in Ezekiel 32, it's a prophecy of Egypt coming up against the armies of Nebuchadnezzar uh, at the Battle of Carchemish, around the time Josiah was king. Uh, but the whole chapter has definite overtones of the Battle of Armageddon. So this is a historical thing that happened, but there's some prophecy mixed in there that looks a lot like the Battle of Armageddon. Um, notice, though, that Pharaoh is likened to a whale, a whale in the seas. Uh, that man, he, there in the Bible, God likens to Pharaoh to the largest animal on earth, the massive monster of the deep, right? Uh, we don't have time to go through all the references uh, this morning, but there are a few animals on earth that Satan is a pictured, pictured by. Uh, a lion, we know, is one of them. Uh, you know, a serpent is another. A whale is one of those animals that he's pictured by. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah 27, look at verse 1. It says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. All right, you say, well, where is that? Well, the only thing in the passage that we can point to, there's only three areas in this whole chapter that uh, you say, well, where is this Leviathan? What sea are we talking about? Well, the only places mentioned in the Bible is in verse 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt. And ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they that were shall come, which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. So that Leviathan in the seas, in the context, it's either going to be, a, he's either at Assyria, or he's at Egypt, or he's in Israel. It's one of those three. If I had to guess, if he's in the sea, Assyria is landlocked. And so the sea, it really, you're down to the Mediterranean and Egypt with the Nile. Look at Psalms 74. Psalm 74. Psalm 74, and we'll look at one more similar cross-reference in verse 13. <clears throat> verse 12 says for God is my king of old working salvation in the midst of the earth thou didst divide the sea by thy strength historically that would be the Red Sea thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters now historically that's the Red Sea but as we know from the Bible God's word amazingly can have multiple applications and so historically, yes, God divided the Red Sea and killed Pharaoh in it, one of the heads of Satan, uh, one of those seven heads in history. But in the future, God is going to divide the sea again. This seven-headed sea, the seven-headed uh, river that we've looked at, he divides uh, the sea by strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan. There it is again, in pieces, and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. So what I want to kind of draw your attention to uh, is all the connections that we have with this area in Egypt. We have Egypt, we have the Nile River, uh, we have these connections with Satan, we have the Leviathan, we have the seven heads of Leviathan, we have seven streams to the Nile. So there's something going on here. As I said, I think the seven heads of Satan and the seven streams of the Nile is not a coincidence. I believe that God designed the Nile River as a picture of the Leviathan, as a picture of Satan. Turn to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. 
Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3. It says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Verse 9, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, like I said, the seven mountains I don't think are necessarily literal mountains. That might be one application to kind of draw your attention to Rome and Vatican City. But those mountains in the Bible can also be kingdoms. And, uh, and I pointed all this out. If you want to get all that info, you can rewatch that uh, video I did on the uh, seven heads of Satan. But basically, those are seven historical kingdoms likened to mountains that uh, the woman has sat upon this whole time in history. Look at verse 10. And there are seven kings, historical kings, five are fallen, and one is, the one that was in John's day was the Caesar, okay, and Rome is still in charge. One is, and the other is not yet come, okay, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. That seventh kingdom isn't going to be around for very long, because it's a tribulation kingdom. It's not going to last more than seven, seven to ten years, okay. So... Then it says in verse uh, 11, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So briefly what you have here is a prophecy of the coming Antichrist. He will be the seventh king of the seventh kingdom represented by the seventh head slash seventh mountain. Okay. And he's the king of the kingdom that Mystery Babylon is associated with, because she sits on that kingdom, that seventh kingdom. Okay? Um, the spirit that possesses the Roman Catholic Church did not begin with Emperor Constantine, with St. Augustine, or Pope Gregory I. That's not where that spirit began. The spirit that's in the Roman Catholic Church right now has been around for a long time, and the Roman Catholic Church is just the mask that she's wearing right now. OK, uh, that Jezebel mystery Babylon spirit began ruling with kings beginning way back in Babel with Nimrod. And then it was then she moved. Then once Babel fell, she moved and she went to Egypt with Pharaoh. That was the next world power that Joseph was part of. You remember that. And then when Egypt fell, she had to go find a new mountain to sit on, a new kingdom. What was the next king, world empire that arose? It was uh, actually the Assyrian Empire that came up after Egypt, with uh, Sennacherib being the king. And then after Assyria, Assyria fell to Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. So you see this spirit is moving each time when these kingdoms fall. Uh, Persia was not one of those seven heads, as I've explained before. It was not run by the mystery Babylonian spirit. It was an exception. All right, so the fifth kingdom then is Alexander with Greece. Uh, the sixth kingdom is Rome, run by the Caesars and the Pope, and that's where the mystery Babylon spirit is right now. And like I said, just like the, the Roman kingdom is pictured by the iron legs, starts out very powerful at the top, but as time goes down, it, it diminishes and diminishes and diminishes and diminishes in size and power. And that's what we're dealing with with the Roman Catholic Church right now. It's, it's a very weak global empire. It still has its tentacles everywhere, thanks to the Jesuits. But it's a, it's a weakened empire, and it's going to fall. Now, the, eight, the seventh is, I believe, the seventh kingdom that's going to arise is going to be the kingdom of Egypt. And uh, run by the Antichrist, who is the man of sin. Okay, And then the eighth kingdom is going to be basically the new world order that the Antichrist, the son of perdition, rules over. Okay, So this is just real, a real lot of information, but just to kind of get us understanding where I'm going with this. All right, The seventh head, the Antichrist, the man of sin, he's going to be killed in the future. And he's going to come back to life. The man of sin will be killed and rise from the dead just like a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Remember, he has, his head has a wound, as it were, unto death. Okay? So the Antichrist is going to be killed and rise from the dead, and he's then going to be made king over all the earth. All right? He's going to be not just king of Egypt, king of the world. Okay? And those ten kings come in at that time, we talked about that. So he would be the seventh king and the eighth king, but it's the same guy, right? He just rose from the dead. He's the seventh, the seventh king was the man of sin. The eighth king is the son of perdition, right? But he's risen from the dead, same guy. Now let's look at this river a little more closely. 
Historically, the Nile River has always had seven streams. And from left to right, they are the Canopic, the Bulbatine, which is also known as the Rosetta now. You have the Sem Sebenietic, and then you had the uh, Fatnitic, which is called the Dimietta now. You have the Men Mendesian, the Tetanic, and then the Pelusiac. Okay, those are the seven streams of the, that empty into the Mediterranean Sea. But interestingly enough, as you can see, it just so happens, okay? Now this map that I've got here of the seven streams, you can find this on Wikipedia. Josephus has, Josephus spoke of these seven streams. This is common knowledge, all right? It wasn't until the last couple hundred years that you only had these two major streams. These have always been the case. Uh, it's interesting, it just so happens that the eighth, you say, well, I count eight streams. Well, the eighth, is of the seventh, and it gets cut short. It doesn't quite make it. The eighth is of the seventh. There's seven streams, and there's an eighth stream, but the eighth is of the seventh. Hmm, that's interesting. It ends at the Wadi Tumilat. The Nile River connected with the Leviathan, seven streams, seven heads. The eighth stream is of the seventh, but it doesn't make it very far. Does any of that sound familiar? <laughs> Very interesting. Now, don't forget, God designed the Nile River to look this way. God designed that. Now, since the Antichrist is the seventh and the eighth king, I want to focus on that seventh and eighth stream right there. The seventh stream, if my theory is correct, the seventh stream would match the man of sin. Okay? And the eighth stream would be like the son of perdition. Both the Antichrist, but man of sin dies, rises from the dead, and he's the son of perdition. He's Satan incarnate at that time. All right? The Pelusiac, okay? The seventh stream is called the Pelusiac. I did all this research, and I just, I wasn't necessarily looking for this. I just thought, oh, it'd be interesting. I wonder if there's anything to it. Start digging around, and it's pretty amazing what I found. The Pelusiac was named after the coastal city that the Romans called Pelusium. Okay? The Greeks called it Pelusion. Uh, that's, that sounds very French, but it's uh, Pelusion. The Egyptians called it Paramount. In the ancient Egyptian times, that city was spelled Pergimen. All right? In ancient Egyptian, if you were to read Egyptian hieroglyphics, basically it comes across like this Pergimen. Okay? Per means the house of, and Jimin means atom, uh, or Ammon. Ammon. So this is house of Ammon. That's the interpretation of per Jimin, what that city stands for, and that's what that, na that river is named after. House of Ammon. Ammon was regarded as, as the sun god, and through some ancient tradition, he became connected and combined uh, with the sun god Ra, as you've probably heard of. And so you have what is generally referred to as Amun-Ra, the sun god, right, in Egypt, okay? In Egyptian mythology, and like I said, you can look this up for yourself. This is common information. I'm not cherry picking anything. This is just common knowledge in Egyptian mythology. Amun-Ra was the transcendental, self-created creator deity who was the champion of the poor and troubled people. A man of peace. He's the voice of the poor. He's the advocate of justice and equal rights. You know, he's probably the founder of Black Lives Matter and Antifa. <laughs> Interesting. Now we're talking about this seventh stream. Just see if any of this sounds like the Antichrist to you, the man of sin. Okay. Pelusium, <clears throat> Pelusium is connected with Amun-Ra, like I said, who would make a good candidate for the Antichrist. And interestingly enough, the Greeks had two names for this city. Uh, you know, you go over thousands of years and cities get different names. We even have that in the Bible. The Greeks called this name, uh, that city, Pelusian, but it also called that city Syene, S-A-I-E-N, Syene. The Hebrews, the Hebrew translation of that is Sin. I don't know if you've ever read that verse in the Bible, Ezekiel 30, 15, I will pour out my fury upon Sin, the name of a city in Egypt, the strength of Egypt. Sin is the strength of Egypt. Not talking necessarily about sin per se, it's the name of a city, 
but it's very interesting. And he says, uh, and I will cut off the multitude of No, also the name of another, another city. Um, it's also speculated that Pelusium was the city of Ramses that the Jewish slaves were building, mentioned in, in Exodus 1.1. Remember that? They were building the treasure cities, Python and Ramses, the Jewish slaves. That was one of them. So the seventh stream, you have Pelusium, also known as Sain, also known as Sin. Okay. Oh, wait, I'm... What am I doing here? I'm thinking over here. This is where the city is. You're thinking, why? What am I doing here? Fat knit. So, uh, I think I got these things mixed up. Anyway, sin. What did I do there? I think I've got these mixed up. City's up there. Anyway, all right. The man of sin. Okay, I'm going to have to fix that later. All right, so this likened to the man of sin. The eighth stream, then, theoretically, would match the son of perdition. All right, the eighth stream, which is of the seventh, is Wadi Tumilat. And Wadi is just an Arabic word for river, okay, or river or channel or something like that. Uh, Tumilat comes from the original name Per Itum, okay, Per Itum, which means house of atom okay so we have a different deity here house of atom uh, tm in, in ancient egyptian means to complete or to finish thus the god atom was the complete one the finisher of the world and in, in egyptian mythology atom is said that he's going to refer return to the watery chaos that he first emerged from in egyptian mythology atom is the first God who created himself from the primordial waters. Hmm. Now, doesn't that sound like something you would hear in public school? <laughs> something creating itself from water. Evolution, then, is a satanic concept that's rooted in Genesis 1-2. Because someone did come from the waters in Genesis 1-2 the primordial waters, and uh, but he didn't create himself. <laughs> He's just telling people that. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, you know, God has a book of life. So Egypt, the antithesis of God of, of Israel, is going to have a book of the dead. Okay, Egypt has a book of the dead, and Atom is the sun god. So he also historically, it's weird, I don't know how they get all these connections going, but Atom gets connected with the sun god amon Ra you know, whatever. But Adam is the sun god, and he's said to ascend from a watery chaos with the appearance of a snake in the Book of the Dead. <laughs> Where do they get this stuff? Uh, you can read it for yourself, but, in a, but that Egyptian mythology, it, you can, it traces its roots to something that's true, Genesis 1-2, but obviously they have a perverted, a twisted version of the story. In Genesis 1-2, uh, Leviathan, or Satan and the serpent, he, he was quarantined under the waters of the deep. And when God separated the waters from the waters on that second day of creation, God created the firmament, outer space, which uh, Satan was then free to roam about the universe. And that's why that day was not good, because those waters were divided from the waters, and Satan's the prince of the power of the air, and all that stuff. And so, uh, when those waters separated, he was able to come out of the waters. And the lie that Satan fed the Egyptians was that he, was, he created himself from the waters. And they believed it. And the lie about amino acids being formed and developing into amoeba and then into jellyfish and then into fish and then whales and then cows and then monkeys and then man is a lie that's still taught to this day in the University of Oregon. Go Ducks, you know. <laughs> it's the same lie that's been being taught since the days of Egypt. Same thing. Just a little more scientific, or like they like to call it. The seventh stream, named after Ammon, has a strange uh, connectivity or similarity to the man of sin. The eighth stream, named after Atom, has a strange similarity to the son of perdition. But wait, there's more. All right? The Egyptian eye symbol. You're probably familiar with this uh, eye. I think it's something like this. I, I probably butchered that. The Egyptian eye symbol. That's not how it goes. Uh, 
Uh, it's good that you don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something. That Egyptian eye symbol, I didn't write it down here. It's very popular, uh, but what you might not know is that it has a right and a left, and each are different and significant. The right eye is associated with Amun-Ra, which is the seventh one. The left eye is associated with Atom, or the, and that's the eighth. Okay. The right eye is associated with Amun-Ra, and when the Antichrist is killed, the Bible says that his right eye will be utterly darkened. Zechariah 11, 17. Amun is the one that's going to be killed, the man of sin. Darkened. When the Antichrist rises from the dead as the son of perdition, he only has one eye left. That's his left eye. Okay? And in Egyptian mythology, the left eye is the eye of Horus. And it's called the Wajet, or the Ujet. Now, these are Egyptian words that mean the whole one or the complete one. The wajet, the eye of Horus, means the whole one or the complete one. You remember what atom meant? It meant whole or complete. The eye of Horus is associated with that eighth stream, the left eye of all things. The Eye of Horus in Egyptian mythology is connected with life, is connected with resurrection in their mythologies, which is what will happen to the Antichrist. He will rise from the dead as the eighth king and will be ruler of the new world order. All right, so the, the way this whole thing ends is Isaiah chapter 11. Let's go there and we'll wrap it up. Isaiah chapter 11. The way this whole thing ends Yeah, okay. I see what I did. Pelusium is over here and I drew it up there. I apologize if that was confusing. Okay. Pelusium Pelusiac. Okay, it's all over there. I put that city in the wrong spot. All right. Good, because I was thinking, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, did I just mess up this whole Bible study and like, not, like miss something and now I'm teaching the whole thing wrong? No, I got, <laughs> that was a relief. <laughs> I was like, maybe I was missed something here and I'm just off in la la land. No, this still matches because Pelusium is over by that Pelusiac seventh stream. Whew. Okay, all right, that would have been embarrassing. All right, so uh, God smites the river in its seven streams, Isaiah eleven fifteen, 15. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. Egypt, I believe, is that seventh kingdom. It's the clay and iron feet of Dan Daniel's image. Mystery Babylon is going to be located there, I believe, which probably means that Catholicism will have to move from Vatican City down to Egypt, and there would probably have to be a Roman Catholic Reformation, uh, and Catholicism would go back more to its Roman Catholic roots. The modern Catholicism, the globalist uh, New World Order type Catholicism, the liberal Catholicism, even the Catholics are saying this is apostasy. Even Catholic bishops and priests are saying that Pope Francis is the Antichrist. I mean, that's crazy. So the Catholic Church has a major schism coming. It's probably going to blow in half, and when it does, it's going to have to move out of Vatican City. Where is it going to go? I believe it's going to go down to Egypt. It's going to be more of an ancient Babylonian type. It's still going to be Catholicism, but they're not maybe going to have all the uh, modern things that they added at the Council of Trent and the Council of... Um, the Vatican uh, Council, some of those things, like in the 1800s, praying to Mary, Mary and some of these other things, the Ascension of Mary, that maybe they'll get rid of some of that stuff. We'll just go back to the basics, call it Chrislam or something, you know, where everybody can be one, because you have a bunch of Arabs down here too, so that would be a convenient thing to do. All right, one way or the other, I think that's where Mystery Babylon is going to be, if I had to guess. I think it's going to be have something to do with Cairo in this area called New Cairo, which is being built right now. Very uh, high-tech city, if you look, at, look it up. Uh, today, in the year 2020, in addition to what we find in the Bible, I believe that the Lord has left us with a geographical, geogra geological, topographical clue uh, where Mystery Babylon is going to be located. Now, remember how I said that there's only two streams left today, the Rosetta and the Damietta, remember? If we were to match the seven streams to the seven kingdoms, 
you know what we would have? We would have Babel, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, uh, Greece, Rome, Egypt, Seventh Kingdom coming, and then that New World Order where he rules the world right there. But notice that uh, the, the uh, two existing rivers that we have, the two existing rivers, the two rivers that God allowed to exist to this day, what are they point to? Egypt and Babylon. Those two of all things. I believe that Mystery Babylon is going to be in Egypt. Mystery Babylon, run by the Assyrian, the Antichrist. That weird thing like you had in the Old Testament where the Pharaoh was the, called the Assyrian that ruled the Jews. He was, a, he was the uh, Hyksos kings that ruled the land of Egypt. You have an Assyrian, Egypt, Jews. Those three kingdoms are the, are, are, uh, have a lot to do with tribulation prophecy and millennium prophecy. Egypt, I believe, is going to be the location of Mystery Babylon. Seven streams of the Nile, seven heads of Satan, seven kingdoms run by the Mystery Babylonian spirit, and God created a picture of prophecy when he built the Nile River. I find that amazing. Let's pray. Father, I come before you today, and I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for these incredible things that are in the Bible that uh, God... They're just sitting there, Lord. Uh, they're just uh, things that could be studied out. And Lord, this book has so many more truths that we've never even touched, God, that they're just there. They've just been sitting there for thousands of years, uh, right in front of everybody, God. And these are the type of things we'll probably just keep getting our minds blown as we're up in heaven and you're showing us the things that we missed, Father. But thank you for uh, showing us this. I pray that, Lord, you'd help us to take these things home. Uh, there's a number of people listening, Father, that uh, have never even considered that maybe Rome is not Mystery Babylon. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would probably even be upset by that thought. But I pray that, Lord, you just, uh, uh, you know, give us wisdom, you know, help us to uh, uh, despise not prophesyings, but prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Lord, thank you for the truth of your Bible. Thank you for this day. I pray that uh, you'd bless the remainder of the day and bless your people, God. You said that revelation, God, is a blessing, Father. And so I pray your people be blessed by the revelation this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Yep. Has he already spitting five rivers? No, uh, those Are have they just. Come back? I don't know if they're going to come back or not, and I don't know if they necessarily need to. Um, it's just that God, they might, but uh, basically the Lord is just identifying which river. If he had said, I will smite the river of Egypt in its two streams, he could do that.